who the current state of professional wrestling or what passes for professional wrestling. I think what's best is that we go back to when there actually was professional wrestling, back when it did matter, back when fans packed the uh, stadiums and arenas and coliseums across this great country, when there actually were fans and not called the universe, back when territories actually mattered, where you could go from Memphis to Miami to Canada to uh, all points in between and get the best of professional wrestling. It's August. It's hot, and uh, just like our birthday. It's hot in here, it's just it, me. It seldom, you know, goes by the wayside. So this is the wrestling historian. Uh, i just got to touch on a few dates here because they were special to me. Uh, August 13th, 1979, right here. Beautiful air-conditioned Philadelphia Spectrum. <laughs> I got some of those words don't belong together. Air condition, I'll give you. Beautiful. Do you understand? Spectrum, <laughs> uh, unlike some of the other arenas that, that had wrestling, yeah, I know. I.e., Philadelphia Arena, uh, <laughs> did not have. So to get people in the building. Question. I, and I don't mean this as an insulting way. Were you of eight? Was Philadelphia Arena still operating when you were a kid? Yeah, that's where I saw my Not second the Civic run. Center, the no, actual, no, no. the one no, on Market the, Street. Yes, the oh, 45th wow. Market, yes. That's where wow. I saw my second professional wrestling match of all time. That's the first time I ever saw Ernie Ladd. In wow, person. at the Philadelphia fucking at arena? At the oh. Philadelphia arena. The main event was Ivan Putski versus Blackjack Mulligan. <sighs> but Ernie Ladd was facing the Mexican heavyweight champion Francisco Flores. And Ernie Ladd, when he was doing uh, commentary on uh, – Vince McMahon with Vince to promote his uh, bout in at the Philadelphia Arena against Francisco Flores. He said, "I want to come to Philadelphia. All I want is fans from the to have complete silence when I walk in the ring. I am the king of professional wrestling, and I deserve complete silence when I walk in the ring." So of course that was my cue to, <laughs> and uh, I was Ernie Ladd was my first heel that I saw in person. And I was not a Francisco Flores fan. I just hated Ernie Ladd so much because I knew about his thumb that was taped up that was due to a prior football injury. So in order to help out Francisco Flores, not because I liked him, but because I hated Ernie Ladd, I was trying to figure out how to tell Francisco Flores in Spanish to watch out for his thumb. And because oh. there was no internet, no computers, or anything like that, the only thing I, I had to help me was my cat in the hat dictionary in Spanish. <laughs> so I was trying to tell him to watch out for his thumb in Spanish. And uh, so when Ernie Ladd walks in the ring, big six foot nine, I'm on the floor, and he just like towers over me, and he just walks in, just going to everyone, just keep it down, keep it down. And uh, he pins Francisco Flores with his thumb and pins it with both feet on the t hanging on the top rope. Referee didn't see it. And, of course, the whole place, including me, goes crazy. How do you not see this big six-foot-nine guy pin someone with both his feet on the ropes? Now, keep in mind, he was in the center. He was pinning him in the center of the ring. But Ernie was so big, his legs were draped over the top rope. And that's how he won. But, yes, I was in the Philadelphia Arena at 46th and Market. It was still uh, there, and they still taped um, a lot of the matches there when I first started becoming a professional wrestling fan. Sorry, good. Hey, Cal. Um, but back to the beautiful air-conditioned Philadelphia Spectrum, August 13th, 1979. While I – that was – in 1975 was the first time I saw Ernie Ladd. August 13th, 1979 was the first man time I saw someone who would be intricate – in Ernie Ladd's uh, career, I was the first time I saw Ted DiBiase. Ah. Person. He was the WWF North American heavyweight champion at the time before he would lose that belt to Pat Patterson and have that belt renamed the Intercontinental Championship. Uh, Ted DiBiase defeated Moose Monroe. And the main event was Bob Backlund uh, going up against Johnny Valiant. Now, the month before, uh, there was a six-man between Jimmy, Johnny, and Jerry Valiant against uh, Bob Acklin, Ivan Putski, 
and I believe Steve Travis and Johnny Valiant had sneak attacked Bob Backlund. And Bob Backlund gave this passionate interview about what he was going to do to Johnny Valiant. And I thought it was weird because Bob Backlund had several big challengers ahead of him, like Ivan Koloff, like Ernie Ladd, uh, like the returning uh, Stan Hansen, Crusher Blackwell. So I don't know why he was giving so much vitriol to Johnny Valiant. So Johnny Valiant is one half of the Valiant brothers. And just like all one half of tag teams back then, not a, not, you know, a big deal, you know, Backlund could take this guy. He's in the ring, strutting to the crowd. And Bob Backlund, keep in mind, there was no music back then. We only saw the, him coming when you would peer down the, the long hallway at the Spectrum. And you saw him coming, and then the crowd would start clapping because they got to see the champion. He would walk or, you know, with his hand up in the air. And, oh, here's Bob Backlund. Bob Backlund, on a dead run, ran into the ring before anyone knew he was coming out. <laughs> ripped off the title belt and just started beating the living piss out of Johnny Valiant and just went on for the match was 15 minutes and Johnny Valiant never got off his ring jacket. It was a 15 minute squash with Johnny Valiant selling like he was 1986 Ricky Morton all around the ring, taking these unbelievable bumps and Bob Backlund won with his patented uh, atomic um, knee drop. And at the end of the bout, they had a big graphic on the Spectrum Titantron. Happy birthday, Bob Backlund. Uh, that was his uh, he his his actual birthday was August 14th, but it was August 13th Good that day. the match took place. And yeah, he he was uh, he turned 30. Um, the day he was 29 when that match took place. But um, yeah, so I got to see a 15 minute squash uh, with uh, Bob Backlund defeating uh, Johnny Valiant at the beautiful air-conditioned Philadelphia Spectrum. August 13th, 1993, another big date uh, where I remember where I was August 13th because I was right here in Philly at the Spectrum. August 13th, 1993, a lot of people knew where they were when the Clash of Champions took place at Daytona Beach. Um, some big matches. Arn Anderson and Paul Roma, the newest horseman. Oh, God. Defeated the team of Steve Austin and Steven Regal because Brian Pillman had uh, busted his, his ankle, couldn't defend the WCW tag team titles. So Steve Regal was his replacement, and the two Steves lost to Arn Anderson and Paul Roma and uh, lost the WCW tag team championship. Uh, the NWA champion Ric Flair teamed up with Sting to go up against the Colossal Kongs, Awesome and King, managed by Harley Race. Uh, the returning Road Warriors, Dustin Rhodes turned up with Road Warrior Animal, and Hawk returned, and they defeated the team of the Equalizer and Rick Rude. This is back when the Equalizer was still treated as somewhat of a of a heel instead of a comedy figure he would later be. And the main event was uh, Big Van Vader pinning Davy Boy Smith. It was interesting because Davy Boy Smith had Vader up in a suplex the patented Davy Boy Smith suplex, and Vader was about 400 pounds. But when, when in Vader's manager, Harley Race, hit that leg, Vader fell on top of him. But I was afraid that the way that Davy Boy was holding him, that Vader would come right down on his head. Thankfully, he didn't. Vader landed on Davy Boy's chest, pinned him one, two, three. And that was the, uh, the end of the bout. But the most memorable thing about that particular clash of champions on August 13th, 1993, was the debut of, say it with me, the Shockmaster. Oh, God. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes. Uh, we don't have to go over the particulars of that auspicious debut, but that uh, live Clash of Champions uh, did a 3.8. I think that was Uncle Fred. <laughs> 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 the other favorite part is him just getting back to the table where Dusty can't stop laughing and he can't breathe. And he just slams the helmet. On, and, he, and Dusty said he just slammed the helmet on the table and said, I effed that up, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you did. I blame, the, I blame the construction crew that put that big tuba for right in front of the entrance. <laughs> that he could, yeah. Goddamn construction crew. Uh, but I also blame the uh, the costume mistress because why wasn't that helmet fastened with a 
Yeah, you ever heard of a chin strap? Anyone? Just, uh, just everything. Like, why? Why would you? Um, uh, just after Black Scorpion and all that other crap with the voice. It's everything about it was a bad idea. I don't understand how they thought that was going to go. Mm -hmm. I don't either. But August thirteenth, nineteen ninety three. A follow-up which will live in infamy. And also infamous, uh, August 13th, 1996, three years later in Cleveland, SummerSlam 96. And the Big Van Vader versus Shawn Michaels uh, for the WWF Heavyweight Championship. Uh, this was the bout where um, Shawn was about to, well, Shawn did come off the top rope and Vader was supposed to move. He didn't. So Sean jumped right off and kicked Vader twice in the head and yelled, move, move. And uh, he's that, so lucky somebody didn't kill, kill him. Well, you know, and that goes on Leon White, the late great Van Vader, who wanted to go along, who um, – it's their fault. I hate saying there's blame on both sides, but Vince obviously didn't know what to do with him. No. And Vader was too nice for his own good, who wanted to just go along and not cause any trouble. So when he was berated by a pip squeak like Shawn Michaels, he took it and didn't do anything. Shawn liked working with big guys, namely Sid, Diesel, Undertaker, because they wouldn't hurt him. They, he would sell for them gladly. They could toss him around the ring. And they, you know, they could be gentle. Sid could be was is known to be careless, but he was never careless with Sean. Vader reputation preceded him of how stiff he was. Ask Hulk Hogan. Hogan hit Vader with steel chairs. Vader could only hit Hogan with wooden chairs, wooden balsa wood chairs. And Hogan had gone on record on the Howard Stern show saying he was afraid of him. That um, doesn't seem safer. No. To me. <laughs> The lighter chairs were what um, Hogan took from Vader. And, but uh, meanwhile, Hogan lambasted Vader with steel chairs left and right. Sean uh, didn't want to get hurt from Vader. And if you see the match, the SummerSlam uh, match from Cleveland, you saw how light that Vader was working, Sean. Jim Cornette was Vader's uh, manager at the time and um, talked about this match and how it went through and how it was supposed to go and uh, stuff that was spots that were missed, not just that one, because uh, John's and because Vader was going to kick out anyway, so Sean could have just as easily landed that elbow, even if Vader hadn't have moved, so I didn't know what the consternation was, but uh, Vader took it in stride. Now, um, I don't, what I don't understand, Dan, is when Vader's last days were uh, uh, looming, why he didn't go to the locker room and beat the piss out of Sean then. Since that was going to be his uh, his last time there, but yeah. Um, yeah. Insufferable. But the August 13th, 1996 uh, SummerSlam in Cleveland. Uh, Michaels versus Vader. Uh, on last week's Wrestling Historian, Dan, <laughs> I mentioned that in uh, August 8th was a big day in Vern Gagne's career because on August 8th, 1961, he won his second AWA title. And on that same date, August 8th, 1963, he won his fifth AWA title. But August 16th, 1960, Dan, was when Vern Gagne became AWA champion for the first time. Ah. Ah. The first of 10 times that Vern Gagne would be the AWA heavyweight champion. The Pat O'Connor was the defending NWA champion and had been recognized as the very first AWA heavyweight champion in May of 1960. But he was given 90 days to defend the AWA belt against the number one contender, Vern Gagne, or be stripped. The match never happened, and Vern Gagne was awarded the AWA title. And of those 10 reigns, Dan... Vern Gagne was given the AWA title on three of them. <laughs> Just hand it over. So Here you go. It, this is you. Yeah, it pays to be the boss, especially if you're if you're Vern Gagne. Uh, August seventeenth, 
uh, Nikita Koloff Day. Because uh, August 17th, 1986, Nikita Koloff defeated Magnum TA in the finals of the best of seven matches for the United States Heavyweight Championship. August 17th, 1986, Nikita won uh, game seven and won the United States title from Magnum and Charlotte. The very next year, August 17th, 1987, Nikita Koloff defeated Tully Blanchard for the NWA TV Championship in Fayetteville, North Carolina. So August 17th, the special day life for Nikita Koloff. Uh, also August 17th, 1998, another date that will live in infamy. Uh, the height of the Monday Night Wars uh, and in WCW's uh, an another attempt to regain uh, the glory years from another company. August 17th, 1998, was the WCW debut of The Warrior. Yep. <laughs> One of the worst debuts ever. Um, well, great for the fans uh, there, but obviously uh, short-lived, just like Warriors runs at any other company after that or before that. But um, that was the uh, debut of... Uh, the Warrior, August 17th, 1998. Really was like one of the worst things that they ever did. Yeah. It, it, it just, I, I don't know why they brought him back. I know Warrior is a garbage person and all that other stuff that came out later, but they brought him up just to just to make Hogan look good. Yeah, and, and uh, it was Hogan's idea. It's all you stupid. Know. Yeah, I agree. Because you're asking WCW fans to uh, relive a time that happened in the WWE um, 11 years earlier, or nine years earlier. I just, uh, that match, Halloween Havoc, it, it was just the, it was a long, it was in the middle of the long downfall of that company. Yeah. I agree. Uh, a couple other, you know, that was a horrible debut, but a couple other debuts happened uh, this month in pro wrestling history. Uh, uh, my apologies for backtracking because some dates, some dates happened uh, earlier this month that uh, went by and I completely missed them. So I just like to thank several websites for bringing it to my attention and uh, they will get their just due right now. Uh, August 4th, uh, 1984, I remember watching on the NWA Worldwide Wrestling. Uh, Jim Crockett, the head of uh, Jim Crockett Promotions, signed Barry Windham to a, at the time, was supposed to be the largest contract in the history of professional wrestling. And they had, a, at the beginning of the, or in the middle of the show, uh, Jim Crockett signing Barry Windham to a big contract. He was awarded a new car. And I was, I'd always been a Barry Windham fan, and he and Mike Rotunda had just uh, debuted on the end, in the NWA, so I was looking forward to them at some point being the NWA Tag Team Champions or Barry Windham uh, being United States Champion or getting the big push. Two months later, Barry Windham would be in the WWF. So that contract signing just seemed kind of um, unnecessary at the time. Uh, what it did do, Dan, was because when Barry Windham left, that opened the door for young Terry Allen to get the push that probably Wyndham was going to get. And obviously, uh, Magnum TA was red hot, white hot. Um, I still believe would have been the NWA champion instead of a Ronnie Garvin. Um, and it well, obviously was in his future, uh, if not for the tragic car accident. But, uh, but Barry Wyndham signing that contract was, uh, I remember uh, being excited about that and then looking up and seeing Barry Wyndham in the WWF. But on that same day, speaking of the WWF, August 4th, 1984, right here in Philadelphia at the beautiful air-conditioned Spectrum, uh, we're in the throw this summer of Hulkamania. Uh, Hogan, I watched Hogan uh, defeat Greg Valentine at the Spectrum. But I was there to see, this was my last wrestling match before I went to college, Dan. <laughs> and right. 
So I was, so this is my last hurrah. This is my last month of being in Philly. I went to college in Florida, but I, I was there because there was a tag team that was making their Spectrum debut. I'd only read about this tag team in After Magazines, and I've been following them for five years. But making their WWF debut, their Spectrum debut, their Philadelphia debut, and I watched if you had, if I had, had Prism, if I had been watching it on TV. Now Prism was a local cable sh cable here in Philly. You can watch Spectrum Wrestling live. I didn't have that, so I had to go down and see it myself. But on the Prism uh, telecast from Spectrum, a limousine pulled up in the back of the Spectrum, and out came Dave Wolf and Cindy Lauper, and they opened the door for Michael Hayes, Terry Gordy, and Buddy Roberts. The fabulous Freebirds made their first, last, and only appearance in Philadelphia at the Spectrum. August 4th, 1984. They started the Freebird music while their opponents were in the ring. And from the time the limousine pulled up, the, the music started. So, and they, the camera followed them from the limousine in the parking lot into the spectrum, down the winding hallway, straight to the ring. And then while the music was going in, I was standing, cheering, and these were, they were in Philly. So it was a lot of smart fans there. They knew who the Freebirds were. So they got a huge hand, and they came out with Dave Wolf. He was introduced first, and after they won, out comes Cindy Lauper running to the ring, and gave each of them a hug, and the place went nuts. And we thought, oh, that was a Cindy Lauper look like because we never saw her, but it turns out that was her. Cindy Lauper was there, in the ring with the Freebirds, August fourteenth, nineteen eighty four. The first, last, and only time they were in the spectrum, and I got to see the Freebirds debut, and I was very humble wow. and very, very happy. Speaking of debuts, Daniel, the single greatest debut in wrestling occurred this month, and I missed it. So I have to apologize to our fans of HIAC Talk Radio, everyone listening or watching on Twitch. I messed up. And I shouldn't because when I research for the wrestling story and what I do for you, the fans, mostly it's just big cards or title changes or stuff that happens in wrestling history that I want to call to your attention. But this is something personal to me that it's always been a big deal. And it went right by. And for that, I apologize. But I'll rectify it right now. How dare you? August 9th, 1999. Monday Night Raw in Chicago, the single greatest debut of any professional wrestler in history, counted down with The Rock in the ring, the Millennium Man, the debut of Raw is Jericho. That's true, yeah. <laughs> August 9th, 1999. The day I knew that, well, I, even if all the stuff backstage I wasn't aware of, the day I knew that WCW was in trouble. Yeah. That was it, man. That... Well, that... Yeah. And, and that's the day I knew that the internet was alive and well because um, the WCW, what passes for their website, had already talked about Jericho leaving. And the signs that were visible in Chicago that night of fans holding up Jericho signs and Raw is Jericho that knew he was going to be there. That's when I knew, wow, this internet is really something. <laughs> this thing works. And even Chris Jericho said, I had no idea so many people knew I was already going to be there. Uh, but yeah, that's still the single greatest debut uh, of anyone. Gives me goosebumps. I watch it. I watch it twice today. I have it on my in my YouTube in my favorites. Um, yeah. Absolutely uh, incredible. That's how Jericho began the, his uh, second book uh, after My Life in Spandex was his uh, talking about his debut in the WWF, lifelong dream achieved, and um, he, he took the ball ring. Had a little stunt, had a little, little speed bump, um, 
a couple months after he debuted, but he righted the ship. And I was telling everyone who would listen, this guy's going to be the next Shawn Michaels. And I, I believe he did better than Shawn Michaels. And he was uh, proving himself to be one of the uh, – he's in my top ten uh, WWE, if you want to call him WWE superstars of all time. I I pay good money to watch his match, to even just listen to him on the mic. His entrance is better than anyone else's. If you got to see it live, you were seeing something spectacular, even if it was the explosion, if it was the light bright jacket, just that Christ like pose at the beginning and the entrance when the when the lights come up. Absolutely awesome. I would put that pop against any pop from the sixties on up, especially to now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, and it'll rival uh, a lot of them. Most definitely. And, you know, Dan, we talk about this on this podcast so many times when I mention old matches or old matches from the NWA. Or even if I mention uh, old matches from the, uh, uh, the Madison Square Garden matches that we, uh, that we watched as, as homework. Uh, look at the crowd. Uh, standing. Jumping up and down. Last week, uh, we talked about the kid who ran all the way from the back of the arena to the front row just to see Ron Simmons win the uh, WCW Heavyweight Championship. And when he saw it, he could not stop jumping up and down. Nope. He almost, he almost did a flip over the railing yes. by mistake. <laughs> uh, and that's gone. Um, yeah. uh, I would love to see that again, but I don't know what product or what wrestler or what angle can get anyone to feel anything like that. Uh, ever again, and that's the one thing I miss. I, I miss the fans. I miss the uh, the interaction. Uh, I, you know, when they uh, when they had uh, Ricky and Robert and uh, Arn and Tully on last week's AEW, I just went back, Dan, and I just watched the Rock and Roll Express entrances against Ole and Arn, or against the Midnight Express. You said you had the heels in the ring just walking around. And then the music hits, and I, I just I just watched the entries. I didn't even watch the match. I knew how good the match was going to be, and these are matches I didn't even I hadn't seen. There was one uh, with Ole and Arn against Ricky and Robert in Kansas City, but I just well, but just to hear the crowd going nuts, and even to hear someone like Jim Cornette that I listen to that shit every day for like twenty eight days in a row everywhere we went, <laughs> it, it was crazy. And to see Ricky and Robert, you know, they got later on their way to the ring, you know. But <laughs> by the time they got there, you know, they didn't even have to go out that night. <laughs> oh, I'm tired. <laughs> oh, man. I need a cigarette. Oh, we got to start a match? Okay. Uh, yeah. But uh, that's what I miss. That's what I love most about uh, the wrestling historian. I can um, relive some great times in professional wrestling back when it was a sport that we both – enjoyed thoroughly enjoyed and hopefully taking you back to where you know it was packed to where you where you could see a team that you've read about and you've heard about and here they were in your backyard finally in your town uh and you get to see them live the freebirds were just uh pictures from an after magazine and when he didn't have cable and all he had was the, the magazine, there was no internet, there was no newsletters, there was no gossip, there was no websites, there was no hotlines. Uh, you heard the free birds were coming, got to go, got to go. And thank God I did because, again, that's the first, last, and only time they ever wrestled in, at the Spectrum. And their time in the WWF was extremely short. If you listen to Michael Hayes, depending on who you talk to, who fired him, I heard it was Andre, I heard it was Vince. But um, they wore out their welcome very quickly in the WWF. Um, but so, again, thank God I was there. And uh, thank God I can share these moments with you, the fans of HIAC Talk Radio. And that, gentlemen and ladies, is the rest Two of the really story. quick ones this week. And, I, um, and I'm a, you're an honorary free bird, Danny? I'm going to need that in writing. I'm going to need that writing. Uh, two really quick episodes this week, and I, I'm very happy for it because I'm going to go watch the Flyers and bash my head into the wall now. 
Uh, thank God they called that one back because, well, that's another podcast for another time. For another said. time. Yes. Uh, but uh, I'm glad I, that you were able. I actually saw pictures of the Philadelphia Arena uh, for the first time in my life two days ago. Oh, really? Okay. I'd never seen it before. I had no idea. I knew it existed because that's where the Quakers played. They, there was a. Yeah. That's not how you're an honorary free bird. I share a birthday with Elvis's death. I'm not dead. Okay. Do you like that joke? I did that yeah. one myself. Um, good. Getting yeah, and that's also where they had the uh, the roller derby. Yeah, roller derby was there. Uh, but um, I I looked up pictures. I'll send you the link to the pictures. The guy has uh, pictures of it. He's been everywhere. This guy. Okay. Every arena or stadium. He's got Civic Center pictures. JFK Stadium. Um, but. Uh, yeah, it just occurred to me when we were starting the segment. I was like, "Gee, I wonder if you've been there." I know you're old. <laughs> yeah, you're old. You had to know you. You were in the you were in the first world war, weren't you? <laughs> Craig, we people will follow you. Oh, uh, they can follow me at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Craig Legon. C R A I G L I G G E O N S. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Danlo eighty three. VOC Nation rate. I did it twice, same, I did it twice, the wrong way. Did it both times wrong. VOCNation.com. On your smartphone, Android or Apple, go to your podcast app, type in VOC Nation Radio Network to follow all of our podcasts. You can watch it live on twitch.tv slash daniel83. You can watch it afterwards, edit it around at youtube.com slash daniel83. Just look up daniel83. It's me, Craig Legans. The Bob Average Community Van Culture. We'll see you next week for Nerd Herders. Have.